They say, yes, at this stage, from the work already undertaken, there is a confidence that any impact upon existing airfield operations is limited and that safety risks are acceptable in line with CAB 760-8 for existing um, operations. Now, that is as far as any consultant would ever go. He's never going to tell you, or she's never going to tell you, there is absolute, we're absolutely certain, 100% certain. Because you can never in this world be 100% certain. All you can do is to have confidence that the impact <coughs> is limited and that safety risks are acceptable in terms of normal civil aviation practice. I certainly take uh, Councillor Davis's point about consultants can go so far and um, in this case they would appear in the report that they've written, uh, commissioned by National Grid, to convey a message of confidence in safety and uh, compliance with civil aviation requirements. However, in reading the Arab report, there's criticism of the process that was followed for uh, CAP 760, which is the risk compliance methodology. And there was a dispute between Arup and Arcadis about the way in which that risk assessment was uh, conducted and how thoroughly it was or wasn't conducted. Uh, such of that is then referred to in the officer's report as something which is acknowledged as a difference of opinion and is given less weight uh, by the officers themselves. Uh, the, the Arab report actually says that, um, in their in their view as consultants again, that they cannot have. They say it's difficult to have confidence that all foreseeable risks have yet been identified, and that is talking about foreseeable risks, which they feel the process has not uncovered. So, the reliance that our case report has and offers based on complying with CAP 760, is actually offering assurance based on an incomplete 760 process, which raises concerns for our independent assessors who are asked to provide that for us. So I really feel that there are some concerns arising from the, the depth and the completeness of this assessment that is evident uh, through the Arcadis work. In regards to the meeting of civil aviation requirements, I have read all the technical reports and the assurance reports, and in none of them have I seen any reference to the Civil Aviation Authority whatsoever, other than there is a statement that the aviation operator has had a dialogue with the CAA and has only established that the CAA would need the project to comply with its own standard of CAP 168 for there to be no issue with the project as proposed today by National Grid. So this really sort of does also um, reflect comments from Britain Norman and other deputies that the risks have not perhaps been properly understood or assessed and as such we don't at this time perhaps know what the requirements of the project should meet in order to satisfy the Civil Aviation Authority. So there are experts that perhaps um, don't have the full view or did not yet consult with the CAA to understand what the project would need to meet in order for safe operations to continue. I actually agree with Councillor Davis on many consultants' reports that uh, they're, they're going to make those statements. I think on this particular one, bearing in mind that these, statements, these reports uh, have come from highly qualified people who, who make the points very clearly, I think. And I think it's right that um, we're never going to get positive answers. I, I think the other point really to mention is the fact that um, if, if you look at um, the uh, statements, I mean, look, looking at the paragraph 48 that we've just put in, there are a lot of conditions there that cover all those areas, uh, and I think that's important. I think also when it comes to the landowner giving permission, if the CAPS 698 areas are not met, then the landowner can refuse permission anyway. 
Today we're talking about a planning application full stop. So I, I, I feel reasonably satisfied that um, we have got the right sort of information. I look at the report uh, and we heard from Britain Norman today about the various points that they were concerned with. Um, I find it uh, slightly um, worrying that Britain Norman have brought out a number of areas they're not happy with. We've covered those in the conditions as well. And also I think the applicant made the point to us that the Ministry of Defence were entirely happy with what the requirements were. So I think we've covered all, all the eventualities. Yeah, briefly, I think we all accept that there are risks and each of the reports, and these are the features of the reports, accept there are risks. But if you look at the, there's a section here on functional hazard analysis process, what they're talking about there is possible ways to manage risks identified during the hazard analysis process are recorded, which they have been done in the hazard log. It should be used to manage the risks to closure. So the writing of the report is the beginning of the process rather than the end of the process. And the management of those risks will have to be managed right through the process of the development of this uh, project if it goes ahead. And a uh, question from the officers, Chairman, possibly is Britain Norman, when they made their, when their representative made his deputation, slightly changed the parameters, I think, to radiation levels at ground level rather than one metre. Um, and so that is a question does that change? the application at all. Uh, if so, uh, and in the management of risks, presumably experts will be brought in to assess and give recommendations with regard to risk management in the future as well as those we have had to date. Correct, Chairman. I, I think the issue is how the cables are actually laid. Now, a lot of it's going to come down to the actual technique they use for laying the cables. What the applicants explained to us is, and, and Mark touched on it in the presentation, if they use the HDD, that was the horizontal directional drilling, one of the issues with it is that the cables are spaced further apart, and as a result, the magnetic field then gets larger. If they can actually, or if they choose to, put them into trenches, they can actually get the cables far closer together. They can lay them in arrangement. It's a tree forward arrangement, it's been described to me. And once they start doing this, then the magnetic fields then get that much smaller. So I think with the figures we've got, as far as we're able to tell, are pretty robust. It's just a case of which method they actually use when it comes to construction. A lot of this also, I think I should stress, Chairman, is worst case scenarios, what they've worked to. I think the applicant actually believes they can better most of this, but they're saying, for the time being, we'll give a commitment at that level, worst case. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Uh, I've got a few comments, but I can just pick up the last point in terms of <coughs> uh, compass deviation. If you go to paragraph 31, the second paragraph down, I think this very much illustrates uh, Councillor Davies' point about what reports say and how absolute they will be in their statements. We're talking here about uh, some impact at 40 metres away or more. The point is made that the centre of the runway is at least 81 metres away from the cable itself. Um, and then there's a comment there that says, on this basis, it's not considered a credible risk of interference. Also, we're talking about 40 metres. I mean, frankly, I would hope most aircraft coming into land at Bladeless at 40 metres are actually looking where they're going rather than just having their eyes uh, drilled onto the instrument panel. So I, I think we, we need to take these elements in, in, in the context. And, and, and the f final comment was it does not represent a flight safety risk. I, we have reports, they do not absolutely guarantee anything, but they give very good indications of, of the unlikeliness of anything occurring. Now, the, the other area in terms of size attractiveness, um, and if you like, the second effect on the airport, was of course the, the extent to which this sort of development might adversely impact the um, attractiveness of the site to businesses coming in. Uh, and that, of course, is a very relevant element to policy CS12, but also a very direct relevance in relation to consistency with the data vision. Uh, 
uh, who the, the landlord's decision maker. The, the Conway report judgment um, is not absolute here um, in, in saying that the conversion installation will not have any adverse impact. Uh, in fact, it does raise some questions that, they, that indicate that there may well be some concerns. So hence the additional element we have built into this application which talks about the provision of expertise to help with answering those questions and promoting the effort to, to future potential users. So it seems to me that, that element from a planning perspective is okay, but from a landlord perspective they would want to reassure themselves that, they, that what is being proposed will maintain the attractiveness of the effort. When it comes to electrical interference, um, in all the elements here, I've, I've found this the most difficult area. Uh, it's technically extremely complex, certainly to me. Um, in fact, it's an area where I've been looking for reassurance. So I very much rely on the summary data that we have from the various um, technical reports that have been presented to us. Uh, and in fact, I'd like to congratulate Mr. White in terms of how he summarised some of those reports into just a few pages. Um, and I found them reassuring. Um, looking to go through pages 29 to 35, um, there's a fairly less extensive but a very good summary of the nature of the inputs that we've received, both from uh, technical evaluations commissioned by us as a planning authority, as well as technical reports commissioned by the applicant and made available. Um, and a number of areas have been identified. For example, I, I saw there was for aircraft that may have been new compass swing areas to be designated on the airfield. Uh, the aircraft holding area location might be, need to be changed. That the crossing points may well need to be changed. And all of those have stated that that can be done. Um, and also that when taxing near to the converse station there might be some static experience. Some static. Now, maintenance of the airplane license and all of the elements come into that is clearly vital to the continued use and effects upon the airport. But the advice we've got is that, as best judgment can be made at this stage, that going down the routes we're going down should not adversely impact any application uh, to the authorities to, for continuation of the license that's currently enjoyed at the airdrome. Um, and that's advice I read from, from the report here. Um, Britain's Norman's concerns remain around the theoretical modelling. I think I can understand that. Um, I think they've been perfectly would like to see some proof. But, but having said that, they do acknowledge that the conditions um, that are being proposed uh, should, within that theoretical modelling constraint, be satisfactory and should, should address the specific concerns. Um, so, although the whole thing is very technical and very complex, uh, looking at the summary data then, you do get some variations of opinion. So the overall message coming through to me is that those electrical concerns can be addressed satisfactorily. Um, the one intangible is the extent to which there will be any long-term adverse impact on the reputation of the airport as a business lo um, location source, and, and that is, in the main, a concern for the landlord to determine in terms of does he wish to continue with this. 